<laughs> okay. So we're continuing uh, with our classes today after you all had a break yesterday. We want to take a minute to talk about the poster session. That might be something of a mystery for what that means. Uh, one thing you definitely know is that the room changed. It's going to be back where we've had most of our classes. Um, so as for what should you bring, um, we have tried to put in templates that have things that you can use to put together these different deliverables. And your deliverables are each of the tools that you've learned about so far and how you've used them in investigating the uh, clinical scenario that you wanted to study. So then just basically you can make it simple, like a third grade science fair. You can print it out, just put it on some poster board. This doesn't need to be, you know, go down to the printer and buy that $200 poster. Okay, you certainly don't need to do that. Um, you may also want to have a member bring like a laptop. So you might want to just put some slides together, something that you can speak to with the judges and just go through your slides right there on your laptop screen. That would be a good way to work too. You might also want to print out some examples of what your check sheet looks like or your survey looks like, um, which is something that we're going to go through today. These this is like the point, the, the, the main point is that you need to, um, in whatever way you want to, be able to display these different tools that you're making so that the judges can see them um, and you know be able to sort of talk about them in an interactive way with the judges. And just somewhere on that presentation, you want to make clear you know what is the clinical setting that we have chosen to work in and what is you know the process that we are addressing. Um, so that the judges, you know, when they walk up, each judge may be judging only sort of one piece, one of your deliverables and your final product, the final handoff tool. So the judge can walk up and sort of look at whatever you have there and say, like, okay, you know, like, this team is, you know, operating in the whatever, the, the MICU, and they are looking at, you know, ventilator associated pneumonias. Okay, I have some context for judging, you know, all the different parts then. And so another thing we should probably kind of talk about is just what is going to be your clinical scenario. We don't need to like go down the rows and say it but maybe a little bit more guidance on how to decide something. Because um, definitely part of what we're looking at here is, is patient handoffs. But I think in talking about that, that maybe there's been a little bit of focus on trying to look at handoffs between one group and another group and just focusing on that process of handoffs. That's definitely part of it. Um, but we want you to narrow down the scope because it's going to make it more manageable. Um, and I think it'll, you'll get more out of it by doing that. Um, so when we're looking in the MICU, every day on rounds, there's lots of things that they need to hand off. They really need to hand off a plan for every organ system. We're just talking about one organ system, you know, respiratory. And there's a decision that was made to put this patient on the ventilator, and we need to hand off why we're doing that and what we're looking towards getting them weaned and off, extubated. Okay, so that's sort of the indication for procedure within this narrow scope of the respiratory system and then just how are we carrying that off day to day? What information are we gathering? What is the assessment we're making? And what are the indicated actions that we're taking? How are we doing that in really a high performance way? Um, so one thing to just kind of give you some guidance, let's say you're looking at an emergency department and that getting handed off to uh, an admitting team, be it medicine or surgery. There's a number of things that the ED needs to look at in a kind of process-centric way. Um, there's quality indicators with a lot of these and so you know things like sepsis there's the golden hour with door to balloon time and the setting of a STEMI 90 minutes and you give TPA for a, a stroke that's going to be you know another time goal three hours to four and a half at our institution um, so you can just again you can still talk about okay I want to look at ED to medicine and I want to focus in on sepsis that'd be a great thing to look at with the data that you need to gather, with how you make your assessment that the patient has sepsis, what members of a collaborative team starts the patient on impaired therapy, and how do we hand that off to medicine and let them know where we are at, what cultures they have, so that they can de-escalate them, you know, take them down off impaired therapy, target in, and get them out the door. I guess, yeah, the point is whatever clinical setting you've decided to work in, it's really helpful to focus on a particular disease process uh, and sort of you know look at the, the process around that, um, or a particular intervention, you know maybe that's related to a disease process, and kind of focus on that rather than looking at you know the entirety of a department, which um, will make your job really really hard as far as analyzing the whole process map for everything they do in that department. You know what I mean? And so then the other kind of I think cool thing about this is there's a limited number of diseases that come into the hospital. And then there's an even smaller number that probably make up 95% of patients that get admitted. 
So there's eight teams this year. Now how many diseases are there that maybe form 95% of what we do? Might only be like 24 disease processes. So you can imagine if we do this over the next three years, we've got solutions to about 95% of what comes into the door. So that's pretty powerful. So that's another reason to focus, get a good project, something you can run with over the coming years, provide mentorship to other people that come behind you, and we think collectively we can really see a major improvement across the hospital. Um, we'll be here afterwards, so if you want to talk about where you're at, you know, do so with us. Um, and also, there's really nothing wrong with just at least mentioning to other teams what area you're thinking of to see what kind of overlap there is. It's fine to get multiple solutions in the same area. So let's move forward with our tool for the day. Um, so this is going to be about the PDSA cycle. And so here's where we're at. We come through, and we're going to be looking at how we use the tools for Monday and Tuesday to help guide us on a PDSA cycle. And then there's a second one here, check sheets. And that's just the data collection tool. You've probably heard about checklists that are used, and, and that ended up being a handoff tool in the MICU was a checklist. Um, that's an example of a handoff tool. This is different. This is called a check sheet. Um, and it's more about gathering data in order to learn more about your process. OK, so where does this fit in? And uh, this is the PSA cycle. So we've come through so far down this model for improvement. And we answer these basic questions about what we're trying to accomplish. And we're kind of now at a point where we're ready to take some action. We want to figure out what we're going to do to improve and move forward on our aim. And there's a couple of reasons that this is really difficult. We're going to look at them in the next slide. But the PSA cycle is going to be a tool to enact change in an environment that doubts change. It's hesitant to change. It's resistant to change. The other thing is, what we found when we were um, on our third years, you're constantly going into a new clinical setting. There's lots of turnover. And even once you're, like, say, an attending in the ER, you're on shift for a few days, and then you're not. And so you need to document what your game plan is, because you're constantly handing off the project concept itself. We're handing off everything all the time. So this itself is kind of a handoff tool. All these data points that we've described over the past few days, these are handoff tools so that a project can have continuity. OK, so what are some reasons that we doubt change? Why are we resistant to change? It's hard habits. Yeah, absolutely. What else keeps us from moving forward? Not obvious results. Not obvious results is a good one. Apathy. Apathy, yeah. Uncertainty. Uncertainty. Um, on whose part? Mm, sorry, I was going to um, If you are, you know, if you've been doing something one way and you know that you get a certain result, mm -hmm. you may be resistant to changing something new when you don't know, like, what the proven result yeah. may be. Yeah, but, so, yeah, I mean, you want some evidence, right, before you make a change. That's very important. So we can maybe combat that. Any other ideas? Yeah. Like risk adverse. Yeah, risk adverse and fear. I think those, we ourselves will sometimes doubt it, you know, in those sort of the dark hours where you're not sure what you're working for and if this is going to improve anything. There's lots of questions. Um, we talked before about people being resistant. They don't even think that change is needed. Um, from an administrative standpoint, they may not think it's affordable. You yourself need to know if your hypothesis is correct. And while you can be really enthusiastic, you've got a team around you, and there's going to be moments that they're starting to wonder if where are we being led. And so can you maintain that enthusiasm? So what the PDSA cycle does is it helps you address each of those. So it provides you know, some preliminary data so you begin to prove your hypothesis. Because you're going to offer an installment plan for change, you have a small cycle. So you don't say, like, hey, guys, let's completely revolutionize the ED. That's really going to cause some pushback and hesitancy. Instead, you make small incremental changes that everyone can manage more easily. You yourself will know that your hypothesis is correct because you're proving it over time, bit by bit. And because you're getting those early wins, your whole team feels invigorated because you're at least moving forward somewhat rather than just looking towards this distant idea of change. And so this is the plan, do, study, act model. And it's a repetitive model. You keep doing it over and over again, incrementally 
improving bit by bit. So when we were talking about the project, uh, the tools earlier, they're about managing the whole project. You know, the aim statement is on the project level. What are we trying to do over the next six months? All right. When we're looking at the driver diagram, we're trying to understand in broad sense what drives the process that we are studying. The PDSA cycle is on a totally different level. It's trying to just manage these incremental components. Okay, so understand that sort of difference in where these tools are used. Your aim statement, your process map looks overarching. The PDSA cycle is going to be used for these little quick, rapid projects. Okay, so a lot of the work is just planning it all out, okay? And so we kind of try to write out a method that you can use to make that planning session a little bit easier. And there's several steps. Across all of them, you need to be evaluating the feasibility. You have to keep your scope reasonably small that you can do a rapid cycle. Okay, so you're going to start by reassessing your aim. You always come back to that. What was our aim? What are we trying to do here? And we're going to show you how to use a couple of the tools that we've already looked at that are on that high project level to help you get an understanding of what you might do in this PDSA cycle. And after studying that, you want to declare a strategy. Then you want to look at what questions you need to ask to determine whether that strategy may be of any benefit or not. And then as you move towards that, you get more and more concrete. You can actually then determine what is the data elements that I need to gather clinically. What's a method that I can use to gather that? And that's when we start to move towards these tools that we're going to talk about later, like a check sheet or a survey. Something you can use to go out in the clinic and just gather some data and then look at it and see where you're at. The other thing that's really important to do is just state a hypothesis. At the end of your plan, make some kind of prediction about what you think is going to come out of all of this. So let's look at our fishbone. Okay, so this was a fishbone for ventilator associated pneumonias. Um, and I've highlighted one here in that it's inconsistent bundle implementation. So we've done a really broad root cause analysis. We have an opportunity to do a lot of PDSA cycles, and we could cover many of those little minor bones. But we're just going to start here. We're going to take a look at this inconsistent bundle implementation. Now, I also wanted to say this, just because we've talked a lot about collaboration, so this lack of accountability. Why would we not want to start maybe with that issue? Because it's up there, right? It was part of our root cause analysis. Why would we not want to start with something like that? Any thoughts? Wouldn't be productive towards moving towards the ultimate goal. I mean, I mean, it seems like you'd want to start with something more positive. Yes, exactly. You're trying to build a collaborative team. You don't want to start off by like finding your villains. Okay? You want to give everyone a chance to improve on their own. And actually, as we go through this. We're going to try to look at different ways that you can do that um, without making it so much as you're going to become internal audit. Okay? All right. So now we're going to look at that gather step that we had had back from our process map. So we're going to use another tool. We're going to look at our process map, drill down on that data that we're gathering. What were the components of our ventilator bundle? Let me say one of them is oral care. That's a little bit narrower scope. It seems a little bit more easy to manage. So let's see where we go. Okay, so here is oral care in, in detail. So we want to look at who has a role in providing this because there are people that we may want to go to get some information from and determining what maybe we can do to do better. All right? And we also have some data that we're already looking at, like orders, are they there? And we also know that we want to talk about like maybe how frequently respiratory therapy is providing oral care. Then you can also look at other bones to brainstorm strategies. Okay, so here we've got the PRN staff. They did not capture the importance. So maybe there's a way, like, the concept of the ventilator bundle, was it consistently being important across all the care team? Okay, so that's maybe something of a leadership issue. Okay, And then here would be another one. Are the teams collaborating to provide oral care? So there may be a lack of communication between the nursing, the RTs, and the EDs. So now let's look at another part of our, our, this was our perform step, right? Back from our process map about optimizing the bundle. And so here, 
we're looking at perform oral care, and that's under the minimize aspiration rights. That was the goal that we're trying to further, is to minimize aspiration. That's why we believe that it will be a benefit. And the task is for formal care. And we can see the respiratory therapist is kind of lonely up there, just on their own, performing oral care. And if we look at these other tasks, I mean, you can just order it once and you're done. You know, you don't have to keep doing these things. So the respiratory therapist, if we look at it sort of like a load balance, who's doing the most work on this goal day after day? A lot of it really falls on the respiratory therapist, doesn't it? And we can kind of see that looking at that form step. Okay, so at this point, we're going to declare a strategy. So we've looked over some of those other documentations that we had from other tools. Now we're going to declare a strategy. So we're going to say that we're going to try to engage physicians, okay, that leadership issue. We're going to try to make it something that happens more frequently by making oral care easier and faster to provide. And we also don't want the RT to have to be the only one bearing responsibility. <clears throat> now, that last one, we kind of would like to approach it in a way that makes it not like internal audit and requiring people to, you know, like, hey, you, you all need to start providing oral care. So how can we kind of transition the culture to where people just do it on their own? All right, so now what we need to do is we need to figure out some questions to sort of interrogate these strategies. So there's really two types of questions to ask in a broad sense. Some measures you need to quantify, others you just need to understand better, all right? So there's subjective and objective data, and those are sort of your two big categories of data. So think about those questions. Try to get a balance of both, okay? Try to, at times, talk to people to just get some subjective data, get some insight. Let them participate in the process of change. Other times you need to just get some quantified data. Okay, so what measures do we want to quantify? Can we think of any others? Or do these look good? So we want to see if physicians are regularly reviewing oral care towards that leadership issue. We want to get a baseline of how often do RRTs conduct oral care. This actually showed up on the fishbone. There was a question of like, do we track oral care? And this is often a problem early on in an improvement process. Is usually when you first enter the clinic and you're trying to measure these things, you realize they are not measured. There's no baseline to go on. You have no idea of actually what level you're performing at. Because in general, this isn't something we do. We don't measure how we perform. So we're going to start doing that. So how long does it take to conduct? We want to make it faster. And then we're going to start with maybe do RNs conduct oral care. Do they participate in providing it? OK, so then the data that we might need, we might say, OK, well, we'll go and look at physician's notes. That'd be a good way to find out. Like, are they making mention in their notes that they're providing oral care? Um, how often? Well, we do just need to get a rate. And how long? We can just do a timed observation of the RTs. But then that seems really kind of silly, doesn't it? To like sit there with a the stopwatch and observe RTs performing oral care and see if they can't do it faster. It's kind of maybe something we don't need to quantify. So instead, we're just going to ask them. We'll just figure out like, what makes it difficult to do this. Again, going towards the idea that they probably have some of the best insights into what makes their job difficult. Okay, so we'll try this again. We're going to say that we're going to do a regular review, do the physician's follow-up, and we're going to look at their physical exam notes. Uh, how often? Medium frequency. And we're going to just... Um, okay, so we're going to observe five patients. Is this starting to seem complicated? Is there a way we can simplify it? Tyler, do you have any idea of like how we might simplify doing all of, we're doing a lot of observations here, which is very time intensive. Probably just have the RTs know what time they go in to do the procedure and then, you know, just annotate what time they leave. So then you can just look at the chart and be like, okay, that took 10 minutes or something. Okay, that's fair. That's probably a reasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, chart review takes a really long time. It does take <laughs> a tremendously long time. 
okay, so this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. Really, a lot of these are bad ideas. Okay, so remember, a PDS I said is supposed to be rapid. So, like, how rapid am I talking about? How rapid do you think I'm talking about? How long should it take to complete a PDSA cycle? Does anyone want to throw out a number? A day. A day, pretty much. The idea here is the evening before, have your plan together for what you're going to do, and the next day, just take the pulse of that clinic. Find out where they at. A day. And this is going to be really difficult to do in a day. There's no way that you're going to provide any patient care if you're doing all these observations of RTs, okay? It's just silly. All right. I think one of the really important parts in that last slide, too, is that, um, could you go back to that slide real quick, Mark? There is a fundamental, oh, yes. there is a fundamental difference between the idea behind clinical research that you're gonna you know, publish to be applicable to every institution everywhere versus quality improvement. You're not doing a randomized control trial. You don't care if the data that you collect is uh, generalizable enough that everybody in the country can use it. It doesn't matter. You're trying to improve the process at your institution right now. So you only need to get enough data to know what's happening at your institution in your process right now. You don't need 10,000 data points. And this is a culturally very difficult to get an academic setting to appreciate. And probably the best way to do it is to find the existing evidence that says it is a good idea to do X. And then just say, here's the article in JAMA. Here's the article in the New England Journal of Medicine, the landmark article that demonstrates we need to be doing this better. And we wanted to then see how well are we actually doing that. The problem is, is often in an academic setting, the first goal is to figure out, well, what would be better than that? Or is it really better? Not just at a certain point saying, this looks like a pretty good way to handle patient care, and now we just need to execute it. So your randomized trial with statistical significance, that's your strategy. Once you've got it, it's about executing it. And that's what quality improvement is about. It's about executing the best evidence, and it is so rarely done. Okay, so we're gonna make this a lot simpler. We're just gonna ask the physicians, tell us how you handle oral care. This is like, they'll probably tell you something. We're gonna ask the same ORTs, and sorry, that should have been our end. This one, we still want to find a way to make a rate. So we're going to have a lot of subjective data, and then one objective data point to get a baseline rate. OK. The other thing that we might want to know is a goal. Do the RTs currently have a goal for like what they try to do? If you've got a rate, and you can measure it, kind of good to get a sense of what the culture currently believes is a good goal. See where they are against that, and then see if maybe the goal should be a little bit more ambitious as well. Okay, so what I want to do now is say, how do we make this calculation? Uh, you get another uh, pointer right there. Yeah. All right, we're going to make this calculation. Now again, towards the idea that this doesn't need to be statistically significant, it really doesn't need to be perfect. The idea, again, is get it done fast. Get it done the next day. So it really just needs to be like a back of the envelope type calculation. So here's one way to maybe do that back of the envelope calculation. Go in in the morning and see what is our census. How many patients are in, in, in today? Then we can ask how many oral care kits are there right now in the supply room? Where they exist? And how many of them are like on the RT's cart? Where are they? Just get, if we mess it up a little bit, it's not going to make that much difference in our final calculation. We just want a rough idea. And then at the end of the shift, we're going to do the exact same thing. And from that, we should be able to calculate a rate. We're also going to do a survey, all right? So does, does everyone see how this could get us a rate? Count the number. Yeah. At the beginning. Count the number of oral kits at the day at the beginning of the day. Count the number at the end. Subtract the two. So you know how many got used how many over used? the course of the day. Yeah. And then count how many patients you have intubated. Right. The number of kits you use divided by the number of patients you have intubated tells you, on average, rough back of the envelope, how many oral kits you get used during the course of that day. So again, not fancy, not complicated, just a quick, dirty way to find out how you're doing. 
And part of the idea here is if like, if your gap between where you're performing and where you ideally do perform is, <laughs> is like not wide, then it's probably not a great opportunity to make big improvement. So if you're sitting here saying like, well, you know, we may have missed some of those care kids and that could like change our number by 0.1 then you're probably looking at a gap that's not wide enough to go in and make significant improvement that's going to actually impact the end aim, right? Okay, so here we want to look at a survey. Okay. Do we think these are good questions? <coughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would agree. They may not know it. Um, hopefully, they would. If they're like a mix of attending, and they should be up on. But I think that's still a fair point, especially when you maybe don't only have academic attendings at your institution. You're looking at what your private attendings do, who you know may not be as immersed in this academic. Um, so, but one thing we do want to do is we don't want to tell them like lead them with like talking about the ventilator bundle. So here we're trying to say we can improve oral hygiene, thereby lower the VAT rate of the engaged position. So we're trying to look at this strategy, and we're asking it by directly talking about the ventilator bundle. So it's sort of a leading question. So just let's make it more vague and just say to an intimate patient. OK. And then we also do want to ask like follow-up questions. And it's good to have open-ended questions. It gives people a chance to talk about how they do their work, they might like magically make a great suggestion on how you can improve things. And then they feel more bought into the process. So when you come back to them and you ask them to improve things, it's really helpful if you've already gotten a little bit of buy-in. OK, what about the unit RTs? What, what do you think is the problem with this set of questions? The way it's working, the questions. Is it taking a while to read them all? Mm -hmm. Does it feel like, a, I mean, it's just a lot of questions, right? Has anyone ever gotten one of those like surveys about your website? Like you want to get feedback on the website, please answer these questions. Did you ever answer them? <laughs> what if it just popped up and it asked a very specific one question about the site and just had a, a place where you could just put in a few thoughts? Still like close it out, but I suspect more people would probably answer, right? We actually did that. That was a little thing I read at Harvard Business Review, and they found that consistently they got much better feedback in regard to the performance of their website when they just asked one open ended question. So just ask fewer questions. Try to keep it between one and four. Okay? All right. So now we got this down to only three questions. We asked them. How often, what's their goal? Okay, we want to know their goal because we're measuring their rate. So we've got those two to compare. We ask them what makes it difficult for them to achieve that goal. In an open-ended way, instead of telling them like, hey, if you have more time to provide great oral care, why don't you want to do that, yes or no? Like, who's going to be like, no, I don't think I would. <laughs> so you just kind of say, well, how would you prioritize everything? You know, that way, that way you maybe learn that they think something else is much more important to prioritize. Okay, what do you see as a problem with this set of questions? So we've got another survey. This is what we're going to be asking our RNs. Kind of like you're pitting them between each other. Yeah, exactly, right? So for some reason, I think I had like some truffle fries that I said. <laughs> They're found in dirt by pigs. So don't go digging in dirt. So what's a better way? Well, maybe ask them how do they handle the situation? So if you don't think that it's, you know, why do you think that hasn't happened? Without saying, like, it was the RTs, wasn't it? <laughs> and then ask them for, like, what's their part of the ownership? Like, how do they manage the care? Okay? Because later we're going to be asking them about ownership, right? We're going to be trying to challenge them to start to participate. And these questions lead them towards that. Another thing that I want to go to quickly in regards to the issue of what if they say that there is a problem with an RT? Because this, I think, is kind of an issue to be aware of for quality improvement. So one, you have a manager of RTs. You don't really need a name. 
if you if they say so maybe another way if you want to try to find out if there's some problem instead of saying like would you name an RT that you think does a poor job just say uh, do you feel like RTs are uniformly providing thorough care and if they say no you don't need to know who exactly that was you can take that to the RT manager if that manager is any good they have a little bit of insight like, yeah I think I know who that is and I'll go do some more training with them like that's much more productive than trying to get someone singled out and again, transfer the ownership of the problem over to that manager. Because again, we're working on a collaborative team. Yes, you have the highest degree amongst them, but that doesn't mean that you're the boss of the RT. It's just the nature of the hospital system. You're not their boss. You have an authoritative voice because you're the physician, but you do not have the power to hire and fire them to immediately, okay? All right, so here's our final outline of the method, okay? So we've got a physician survey. We're just going to ask five. We're going to do this calculation. We've got a comparator of the RT's goal. So we're going to start measuring the rate, something that probably hasn't been done before in this setting. We've got a survey of the RTs and a survey of the RNs. They're all a reasonable number of questions. We can ask them quickly. We don't get into digging in dirt. If we don't ask leading questions, it'll probably go a lot better. We'll find out some good information. So now we're ready to make some predictions. Okay, so what do we predict to learn? So you just write something, okay? And here we say that they provide, let's look at this one and just kind of note it, because this is in the end what got changed. So they're providing it, their goal is six, and they're, we're going to predict they do it five. Okay, here's also something gathering supplies, maybe that's a big difficulty. And if anyone's done a procedure, that's a huge problem. Like when you go to start a central line, the, it's not long enough, so now we gotta go through, or oh, I am not sterile, so we gotta get a new set of gloves. Everyone sits around for five minutes while the circulator gets another set of gloves. So just to recap what we did, all right, so we reassessed, we looked at our other set of tools, a fishbone and process map to help us narrow down a scope that's appropriate for one rapid cycle. And we use it also to help us predict some strategies. Okay, these were some of the strategies. Then we wanted to look at our needs and we kind of categorized them into these quantifications. We wanted to find out how often it is that we receive oral care. That's a nice new rate to start studying. And then we just want to understand about team attitudes and difficulties. We're going to look at the count versus the goal. We're doing these surveys. So here's how we're going to fulfill them. Surveys and an actual counting rate finding method. And then we've made some hypotheses. So there's a separate template in the handout. And it's going to just show you this. It's in a PowerPoint um, that may be a little bit easier to play around with and split the cells as you need. Um, and kind of see how these have gone in. Again, you've got the strategy, the data needs, which you have a question and your answer, and then you pick a fulfillment method. So here we're looking for insight to the proper fulfillment method is going to be a physician survey. We're getting subjective data. Down here, we're looking at a rate, okay? And therefore, the proper fulfillment method is a check sheet. we got a hypothesis. Okay, and that should really fill out your entire PDSA in the planning section. Okay, like we've said, you do. It's not a significant data. It's not sufficient to publish. That's not the goal. The goal is to have a rapid cycle. Here's something to consider. If you're going and asking for a very expensive project, very expensive implementation, it stands to reason that the hospital administration is going to want a little bit more data. So make your data needs sort of commensurate with what you're going to request, okay? If you're requesting to get published in academics, then yeah, you need 10,000 samples. We're not really necessarily requesting to do that here. We're going to, the, maybe the most that we're going to request is some changes. A lot of those can probably be done within your unit that really ever have to involve hospital administration because it's a map to change the culture and you don't really need money to do that. Um, but when you get into situations where you do, you're going to need more data. And also remember that results are probably more convincing than data about the problem. 
being able to prove that we made a little bit of an improvement through one of these rapid cycles is going to get buy-in from your CEO to put down big bucks to make a bigger change. And again, the reason is we just want to generate enough data so that we're creating solutions that are based on observation and not conjecture. And I talked to one of the teams yesterday, and they had something that was kind of an interesting idea. They were going to go to a few surgeons. They found out that the surgeons didn't think what they felt was a problem was a problem. And I pointed out to them, you essentially did a PDSA cycle. You didn't know it yet. You didn't do it in a formal way. But that's what you did. And what did you learn? Well, you learned that not everyone agrees. If you had moved forward with that conjecture that was a big problem before having made that observation, you would have embarked on a lot of effort that probably would have proved itself to not be very useful. So now we're going to revisit this check sheet. Okay? So we're gathering, we're saying that there are eight patients. We write in that it looks like there was about nine. One came in midday, so the average was eight and a half. And then we had a plan for like how are we going to control how many oral kits there are. Well, why don't we just take out whatever was in the supply room to the beginning of the day, get out a fresh box. We know that it's 100. Put the old in your office so they're out of reach. Make sure that you know the RTs might have some other cards. Maybe there's some laying around in the patient rooms. Again, this is an estimate. It actually was 115 to difference of four. If you're looking at decimal points differences in your rate, you think that's going to be the difference between doing or not doing a change, then you probably haven't found it in an area of big enough impact. All right, so this is what we found. So this is another little template that you can pull out of this right here. You can just remake yourself in a PowerPoint. We got our question, okay? That we answered with that check sheet. What's the rate? We had our hypothesis, which was five hygiene kits per patient. And our finding was they actually did less than four. So there's a little bit of a gap, okay? Probably enough of a gap that we could do better. And just because we set our hypothesis that they were doing five, that doesn't necessarily mean that we thought five was the ideal number to achieve. We'll see where they actually went. It was quite a bit higher. So we, the idea here is, again, you just lay out the same things. Your question, hypothesis, what you found. So this is the new part that came out of your do step. And then you compare these two, and you come up with an analysis. And this is the contribution of the study step. OK, the RT recommendations. All right, so you know, they like the idea of there being a little bit of rebalancing of the load or and maybe even kind of said that, you know, we help them, why don't they help us? The RNs did have some good things and some not so good things to say. And they also had an observation that maybe when it didn't happen, when you didn't get, you know, like, oh, they came through and they did everything except provide oral care. The reason is because they didn't show up with supplies and they just said, okay, I'll make sure to do it next time. And so then knowing that, we can say, well, you know, why not just stick them right next to the bed so they're there? You don't have to carry around in your car, they're just there. Again, extremely simple change to make. Okay, so there's some actions that we can take. We might fit them within some categories. There's more categories, but I just threw these up here. Issues about teamwork, things about reminders, sometimes just reminding people to take an action is helpful. It might be an intervention. And then this is a really big concept, just making it easier to do the right thing, what we know the best practice is. So what can we think of as different ways to make some actions that would fit into these? Do uh, you have any ideas, Bob? Mm -hmm. Erica? Um, maybe like, I don't know, a simple thing is like when a patient's going to surgery, they have the NPO on the door, so that's like a simple reminder. Yeah, that's a really good one. Yeah. Do uh, you have any ideas, Mike? Actions you can take. Oh, you mean specifically for this? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> teamwork, <laughs> reminders, make it easier to do it. Right. So, yeah, so, yeah, we want we want to take actions in order to just, you know, some of the things that we've been discussing. Like we want to get our, our original strategies, which it seems like per the results that we gathered in our surveys and our check sheet, they look like the good strategies. So we want to take some actions now. We're convinced enough, based on our rapid cycle of getting some data, that we think we can stay steps ahead 
and actually execute on those strategies. So getting physicians engaged, getting a shared workload of the RTs so they're not the only ones providing oral care, and getting the, just more frequent oral care. Can you put it on the MAR? I'm sorry, what do you mean? Can you put it like on the MAR? Like, instead of like it being like a medication that you're giving, oh, like yeah. oral care that you're giving for yeah. like X hour, and then do it alternate for like <coughs> an RN to do it at this hour, uh -huh. and then it would show up on the RT's MAR two hours later, so then like every other hour, someone's yeah. doing it. Yeah, that's, that's quite clever. I like that. You can okay. a supply room checklist for the RT whenever he goes to the... <laughs> Okay, so they, they take a checklist. They have, they everything. Yeah, okay, good. You can store the kits in the room. That would even, yeah, that would take it one step further, right? So one thing would be make sure you get everything when you go to the supply room. The other would be take this out of the supply room, put it the patient's bedside. Okay, so teamwork, the physicians are going to start assessing oral care. So they might be like in their note, in their daily progress note. They might just say, you know, patient oral parents was clean, dry, and intact. Um, yeah. All right. Um, you can train patient care assistants in oral care. So this could be an interesting way of not necessarily, you could maybe not do this, don't mandate that RNs share, that's something that they eventually did, but you might just start by having RNs train the patient care assistants. They might just kind of, you know, thereby naturally start doing it themselves. And if you place all the supplies right near the ventilator, so maybe the reason the nurse wasn't doing it before wasn't because they didn't want to participate and be like a good you know, team member. They just, they didn't have access, to, you know, it was more difficult for them to leave the patient to go get the stuff out of the supply room and come back and actually do it. It just seemed much easier, that's the RT's role. As soon as you put it there in front of them, they just start doing it. Okay, so quickly, these actions, like we've said, they require an authoritative voice. You know, there's a lot of things about training and mandate. And in a collaborative team, you don't necessarily get to be an authoritarian, but you need to have the respect of the people that you work with. You have to lead by respect. Okay, and then here, I mean like, just this concept, it seems really simple, but from the RN's perspective, they might say, well, there's a reason that the RT, they have a supply closet. Like, why can't they just keep it there? Why can't they just remember to bring everything? Why don't we help them remember? I don't really want, I've already got so much stuff here in this patient's room, you're really asking me to clutter it up further. So it's not necessarily gonna be just as easy as sticking them in. People might feel like it's kind of invasive, it makes things more confusing. Okay, I'm gonna quickly go through this, just to see one way in which you might demonstrate taking further action. Okay, so there's many possible next scope, steps, but again, you use your fishbone to narrow the scope. You're assessing feasibility, and you may want to prioritize the teamwork solution as we've discussed. The strategy, so what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna do a little bit longer. We're gonna do it for one month. We're just gonna test out having the oral care kits right there, okay? It will provide an opportunity for the nurse to participate on their own. So we wanna keep on quantifying. We wanna keep on measuring. We've started to institute measuring frequency, and we'll just continue to do that. Um, we don't necessarily want to measure every single day, so we'll just measure sporadically. So we'll ask the RTs to see if their goal bumps up. Do they get more and more ambitious about supplying oral care? And do we also see that the RNs themselves adopt the practices? So we can reuse a lot of the same things to gather the same data. We just reuse the check sheet. Okay. And then we make new hypotheses. So we think that we'll increase four times to six. The RT will get more ambitious and say they want to do seven. And we think half of nurses will begin participating. So this is what actually happened with Dr. Patel. So they actually increased it a lot from four to 10 times per day. And like I said, it's like a big change that you're trying to achieve because this is one driver towards an end to aim. And so this big change may only have a smaller impact on that actual really ambitious aim statement of eliminating BAPs. But it's gonna get you part of the way there and other rapid cycles will get you a little bit further. And so this is why this idea is that improvement gets improvement. You've made some gains, people can see the results, you're beginning to act like a team, 
and you move further and further towards that goal. So Dr. Cow is gonna be one of our judges. She donated generously. People that are interested in surgery should know about her. She also leads um, a session, I believe, during the summer in which she talks about um, just sort of, it's more towards statistical data gathering for clinical studies. She is quite interested in how you can sort of converge more statistical significance into quality. And we're gonna talk about that tomorrow um, with a different tool. So let's look at a little bit more about check sheets, okay? They're actually kind of similar to the gather step that you're gonna do for your process now. So <clears throat> this is from Dr. Wafuerzo. She used a check sheet um, to gather data about OB. We'll take a look at it. But these really are exactly the same as what you will be have already done for the gather step of your process now. So we can see it right there. We've got our data, the predicted range, and we said where we're gonna get it. So let's look at the ones that remain. So define each variable, identify what type it is, and determine codes. So the last one will make pretty clear sense. Discrete or categorical, this is like you gotta be either or, you can't be both. Continuous is a range which doesn't have these discrete values, you can have decimal points. We'll look at a type of each data. So one that she was looking at um, was hemoglobin A1C. So we wanted to find it. Okay, so our definition is gonna be the number of times that the physician ordered this lab test within 12 months. Notice that we wanna put within 12 months, so we wanna have a time period. Okay, so what would maybe be our most recent hemoglobin A1C definition? So the, the definition of the number of times checked would be more specific by saying that it's gonna be recorded in the medical record within the past 12 months. What do you think would be a better definition for just hemoglobin A1C? Okay, so here it comes up. All right, so we've got number of times, that's one variable. The other variable is gonna be most recent hemoglobin A1C. This is a discrete measure, and as usual, we've kind of made this hypothesis, we expect it to be zero to five. It's kind of a realistic number of time. You don't check this every single month. And the most recent is just gonna be recorded in the medical record within the past 12 months. So we're gonna consider it insignificant if it was more than 12 months ago. That's what you do clinically. If a patient doesn't have one that's really old at a certain point, you just say that's insignificant data. But that's continuous because you can have 5.9, 6, 6.1, it's continuous data. So about determining codes. So another thing, if you've got a patient with diabetes, you may or may not want to consult an endocrinologist. We also know that there are different rates at which different races are affected by diabetes. And so we might want to have codes in for those. Again, this is very data driven, okay? It's kind of about how you put in a number so that the computer can see three and no Caucasian. And it can then do calculations on that. Yeah, this coding, you this coding part is just entirely about making it easier for yourself to analyze your data, data later. Yeah. Okay. And then, so here's what this would look like. We've got our measure variable. Was it discrete or continuous? Definition, <coughs> which I just put dot, dot, dot. An expected range. And again, we always put the location. Okay, so that's our data model. Well, what we want to look at quickly is design elements. And these may not necessarily jump out at you. So real quickly, uh, I just want to touch on the difference. We use this term check sheet and this term checklist, and you'll kind of hear those used interchangeably. Really, the only difference between the two is a check uh, a checklist is something like this, where you have like you know bo like boxes that where you put a check next to something to indicate that's the thing you're selecting. A check sheet is really if you just have like a field and you're just like making tick marks and saying like, okay, there are one, two, three, four, five of these. You can really use those terms interchangeably, but just so that it gives you a little bit more clarification, you can collect data sort of by putting checks next to boxes like this or by tallying the number of things. Either way, what you're doing is counting discrete data to sort of get you know a quantity or a rate for something. Okay, so I'm gonna pull out a few things right here. Within this, 
So we're going to do a little bit of critical effect of where this work. In order to make this as easy as possible to use, there should be some kind of sensible order to these elements. Similarly, anyone that's been out B, non-reassuring fetal status is not exactly a typical term. It probably makes sense in her clinical setting, but if she wants to engage like a third-year medical student, it probably would be easier to use a typical term. Which, Brian, what would be the typical term? So usually you'd say non-reassuring non -reassuring fetal heart tones to specifically call out what is non-reassuring about this fetal status. It might make sense looking at that to you know an OB who's experienced in the field, but to a third-year medical student, they might have a question about, well, is this the same thing as what they say when they mean non-reassuring fetal heart tones? All right, so let's go through some. We just talked about that. But these organized. Maybe you want to organize them alphabetically. Maybe they should be organized from the most common to the least common. Something that just makes that section a little easier to use. Another problem, why did these all of a sudden stop having the check mark next to them? Are we supposed to circle these now? It's not necessarily immediately intuitive what you're supposed to do. And we had been consistently using two columns. Now all of a sudden we jump to three columns. So here I made a possible check sheet for the MICU. And it has the exact same problems. I just made it so it had the exact same problems that we just covered. And then I put it into a way that might make a little bit more sense. So we've categorized residents on this side, faculty members on this side. We've just simply alphabetized this. We've also kind of highlighted the fact that this is hypercardia and which element on the APG is what you're going to look at. Again, so it jumps out to you just a little bit more easily. And then we rearrange our intervention type and we made it so that it's got this line, so it's consistent. And they just go down the line. Subtle little changes, but I just wanted to take a minute to kind of look a little bit about design elements because it's not otherwise taught. Here's a template that you've got. Let's talk quickly about deliverables that you would use for this PDSA cycle. There's the plan worksheet. That's a template and a handout folder. For doing, so we want you to have a blank check sheet and appropriate surveys. In other words, you're going to come up with, based on whatever you're looking at for your process, you're gonna come up with these tools, like what would I use if I wanted to actually go and gather this data in hospital? Desi like design it, write it out. So that if you wanted to, you could carry it into the hospital and go over and fill it out right now and actually get some data about whatever it is you're looking at. Make sense? And then we would like you to do that once. Again, it should only take like five minutes. Walk over next door, go to your appropriate setting, and just quickly use it. You don't need to get five of each, you just need to get one. Okay? The idea is to just give you the experience of just doing it. And, and we think that will also improve the quality of the actions that you can take based on getting out there, doing it, and just doing a quick PDSA cycle. We always sense how fast it can be, and then you can get better analysis of your act. And to say a word towards that, um, I shared in the documents folder um, a document that lists sort of the total point values for all of the different um, deliverables that you're going to be making. There's a total of 300 points for the whole competition. And so one thing you might be worried about is, okay, you guys want me to actually go into the hospital and complete one of these check sheets and complete a survey? Like, when am I gonna possibly have time to do that? Well, we've weighted the points such that completing a check sheet and a survey is actually worth point-wise very little. It's worth 10 points out of 300. So if you can't go into the hospital and actually complete one, it's not like you're going to lose tons of points to be at a disadvantage. But what we will say is that it's like the commercials where they're like, you know, so-and-so, $10, the experience, priceless. Mm -hmm. Same kind of thing here. If you can just send one person from your team over to the hospital at some point, to actually try to fill one of these out and talk to someone that's on the team that you're you know, looking at studying and just get their feedback and just have the experience of filling in that data, I guarantee the experience of that will be priceless for the rest of your project as far as just figuring out like, does this work? You know, do we have, are our assumptions remotely accurate? You know, is there any way that we can make this better or easier to use? It, it, it will be a very beneficial experience for you if you can just find time to do that once. One sheet, one check sheet, one survey. That's all you need to to do and you'll get an idea. And let me just make a couple suggestions on how you can do your act step to look a little bit open. One thing is just describe it. Like do like a half page just saying, based on what we found, this is what we would do and why. Alternatively, you can do what I did, which was to quickly run you through a second PDSA cycle and kind of be able to speak to 
why you made this decision to, when you're speaking with your judges. And we're going to throw some, some more templates up in the handouts folder uh, such that you'll have something that will kind of give you some guidance about, you know, what is it that I should turn in for this. So we're going to, we'll give you some forms where you can kind of fill all of this stuff out in a more guided way so that it's a little more clear, um, you know, sort of what it is that you'll have to, you know, present at your poster session on Monday. All right. That is the end of it. We're going to be here, so if you've got questions, absolutely. I have a question. So you yeah. went through just the oral hygiene uh, yeah. rapid PDS, but do you want that for like every component on the process? Uh, I mean, it seems like that would be a lot of work. No, absolutely not. You only need to pick one PDSA cycle to look at and analyze okay. and sort of go through the thought process of. Right. Because that's really how a real improvement project would work. You'd look at this process map, find all of these different areas where you can make improvements, mm -hmm. and then pick one place to start and okay. do a PDSA cycle or two there to see if you can make some improvements. So that's all we're asking you to do. Yeah, you only have to do that for one area, not for all of them. Yeah, the idea is to use your tools to narrow the scope to make it easier. <laughs> All right, well, I'll send out another email with a summary of today and with a little more guidance as far as that stuff. And we'll be around in this room until 5 o'clock just having like office hours. If you want to talk to us about your idea, ask us questions about any of these tools, get any more clarification.